You can tell them. <laughs> I can edit it they out. They will live in infamy. Right, I'm sure you would. Um, so, um, Justin was very great, gracious and helped me get some copies of things that I should have done. So I'm just going to just divide this and send them around. Feel free. To be, there's not quite enough. I think there's going to be one. That's great. Thank you. And there's going to be plenty because you, you doubled, so I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to stand not because I... I just talk better when I stand. I think because as a teacher, I stand when I talk all the time. But um, <clears throat> really what I'm going to try to address and we're going to talk a little bit about today is um, the challenge that one of the things that came up for counselors over and over and over uh, in the evaluations and particularly just in even just conversations was I'm looking at this curriculum and if I were in such and such a grade or such and such a level, uh, particularly CYF2, it would make sense. But I'm working with Cairo, or I'm working with mini campers, or I'm working with um, uh, a grade that, you know, junior camp. And so I don't know how to adapt. I don't know how to make it make sense to them. It's too complicated. <clears throat> and I'll be the first to admit that I can see why that happens. Because even as, um, <clears throat> as somebody who's keynoted before, you know, you look at the curriculum, I've looked at the curriculum, I've, I've had to figure out, okay, how do I translate this for 12-year-olds? Um, and how do I, first of all, take the message and adapt it, but then, two, put together a delivery style that makes sense to 12-year-olds? Because uh, it's a very different delivery style than maybe a 17-year-old. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about that process uh, and how we can go about it. Because really... Um, the truth is, though, that one lesson, particularly um, when we just look at the, the text, the scriptural text for some of the major themes of a, of a particular lesson, that can really go across a lot of different age, age range. It, but it takes some planning. So I'm, I'm just going to talk with you a little bit about a, a process that I use that you're welcome to use, and then we may even practice with one. That's what that. What you have is, is two pieces of paper. The first one is uh, one of the specific curriculum uh, curriculum days from last year. So as a counselor or as a director or as a keynote, we would be given this particular lesson and we'd say, okay, this is that day and we're going to have to figure out what to do with it. So we're going to play with that in a minute. The second thing that I've given you is just a nice little handout in terms of looking at uh, some of the different uh, developmental levels from around age 11 through particularly like CYF2. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the younger, the younger levels too, but I wanted to give you just a couple of things to take with you. So let me just talk a little bit about the step that I, the, the process that I take. Mm, which color? This is the hardest part. Um, so um, I do a couple of different things. So if it if it seems oversimplified, hang in there with me. There's a reason why I'm going through step by step. So the first step I take is I read the curriculum. Um, um, now you may be thinking, okay, why are you writing that down there? Because some counselors don't read the curriculum. <laughs> That's why I put it down. Uh, you, you, you show up and you've been busy. I understand your life is crazy. You're a volunteer. And you get there and you're thinking, okay, what can I do in these first couple of days before, maybe day and a half, maybe before the, the kids show up, to get myself ready? And it's like I'm getting ready today for tomorrow. Or I'm getting ready tonight for tomorrow morning. Uh, so, really, we do ourselves a uh, disservice if we haven't take, at least taken a look at the curriculum a little bit in advance, just to buy ourselves some time. So I read the curriculum. Then, the second step is I do, I determine um, what I will call themes, okay? You might want to call them lessons or whatever, uh, but themes. So if I look at the curriculum and I read through, I begin to think about what are some of the major points? What are some of the major elements that come out of this for me? And notice the last two words I said were for me. Because you're going to read this lesson, we are really going to read the lesson through our own lenses, through the glasses that we look through, through in life around us. So what's going on in our lives, uh, what, we're, uh, well, what we know, what we don't know, is all going to shape what comes out of it for us. So, but we want to determine themes. Because those themes are going to drive what we do next. Okay? Um, so those themes, what I want to do is then I want to begin to apply it, and I'll talk about what that means, to, um, um, I'll just say to lives. But in particular to the lives of the, the, the people that I think I'll be working with. 
So when I identify the themes, I'm going to begin to apply them. And inherently, I'll do it first of all for me. So when I start reading about having a deeper faith, I begin to have to evaluate my own faith life. I just do. It's part of the process. And that's part of why we grow so much when we're a part of the counseling team. But then I'm going to begin to apply it to my, my students' lives. So now, this is where it becomes a little more developmentally challenging. So if I talk about having a deeper faith, that's going to mean one thing for a 10-year-old. It's going to maybe mean a very different thing for an 18-year-old. So this is the first point, really, where we begin to differentiate. Um, we'll talk about that more later, too. But the next step I do is I apply it to lives based on the developmental level. Okay. Okay. What I mean by that is uh, the population that I'm working with, the, the counseling ages group that I'm working with, um, I'm going to consider a developmental level. So for instance, well, I'll give you a for instance in a minute, and I'll show you how to go through this process. Uh, but then last but not least, then I adapt and create. Okay. I take these five steps, even though they may feel like they're not significant steps. I haven't gotten anything through first four other than that there's nothing created yet. Step five is really when I begin to create. We're going to practice creating here. So <clears throat> you've gotten the chart on the, the, old, the older kids. The younger children in particular, one of the probably the most basic sorts of things we want to think about, one is attention span. Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, and in general, in general, uh, the 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 best guesstimation that we have about attention span is about three to five minutes for every year of age. So that means if I'm 10, I can do anywhere from 30 to 50 minutes. Okay? That's my attention span. Does that mean I can sit and listen to a sermon for 30 to 50 minutes? No. That means that I can give something my attention for 30 to 50 minutes. My, but that could be a TV show. Uh, that could be a lesson in general. So what does that mean if you have an, um, a 10-year-old and you have family time for 90 minutes? That means that you can guarantee that probably safely you're going to have that 10-year-old's um, attention for about 30 of that 90 minutes. So that means you're going to have to have two more cycles of that kid's attention span to do something else. Um, so in terms of attention span, I want to make sure that what I do is realistic within that realm. We've run into that problem before in camps, where we've thought that these children should be able to sit and they should be able to listen. Yeah, and my dad used to say something along the lines of, if we had some ham, we could have some ham and eggs if we had some eggs. Uh, the reality is we don't, <laughs> have, we don't have those things. We don't have them, so we can't, uh, we, could, we could pine for them, we could wish it was a reality, but it's not a reality. Ten-year-old's not going to give us much more than about 30 minutes of, our, of his or her time. So attention span is going to be a part, uh, in very key. <clears throat> also for younger ones, we want to, make, we want to be aware of uh, basically cognitive development. Okay? So the younger a child is, the more difficult it is going to be for them to be able to take somebody else's perspective. So if I'm in um, particularly those primary ages, those younger elementary ages, uh, mini camp, junior camp, uh, I can learn facts. I can learn um, lessons related to my life. But it's going to be very challenging for me to understand how it feels for Ian or for Emily or anybody else. I can't really do that. I don't have the cognitive skill to do that. That has to do with brain development. It doesn't have anything to do with a child being selfish or anything about with them not being brought up correctly. It just has to do with what their brains can do. And they can't do that yet. So particularly when I'm designing lessons for younger children, I want to talk about facts. I want to talk about individual lessons that they can get. And we'll talk, we're going to do a little example of one. Uh, but I, but I'm, it's going to be difficult for me to try to get them to put on somebody else's moccasins, if you will and see their view. They're going to be able to put on their own moccasins. How would it feel if somebody did this to you? Well, that would make me sad. Uh, but how would it feel if somebody did that to Ian? They're going to tell you the right answer, but they're not going to necessarily feel it. 
So we want to make sure that we're aware of what, what Piaget called that co concrete operational stage, where they're just, they, they really have that one view, uh, but they're still very self-oriented, they're very egocentric, that sort of thing. As they get older, they're able to deal more with abstract thought. Abstract thoughts would be like the meaning of something. So, <clears throat> well, I'll give you an, again, we're going to give you an example of these in a moment, so rather than try and chase one down. Um, I do want to mention, and I, not to make it too teachy, but it's my job as a teacher, but, but I don't want to make it too teachy, but there's this guy named, uh, and Kyle, you probably know all about him, and certainly probably Nancy, you do too, but Lev Vygotsky. He's a theory of uh, social learning. And uh, Vygotsky um, poo-pooed a lot of the kind of typical, standard, traditional uh, uh, developmental ideas. Uh, but uh, he did talk about, um, basically, he called him zone, the zone of proximal development, I think, something like that. And uh, so where uh, I elicit learning from a child. Um, so I take something that's known. And if something's difficult or challenging, or an idea is challenging for, uh, for a student, I give them enough assistance. This process is kind of called scaffolding. I, I provide assistance where, whereas they can get to the next level. And that's really what we want to do. We want to help a child begin to apply tr the, the faith to their life. And scaffolding is a really great image of that, a really great process, I think, in that. In that what I mean by that is I share, um, we talk about something like love, maybe. And I talk about, we talk about how we're supposed to love one another. And I ask a question of my mini campers, well, how do we show love? That's a really tough question for them. They'll, you know, maybe I share, I'm nice to people. Okay, so they're going to be able to give us some. If I ask that question to my CYF2 folks, they're going to have very different, much more, much richer answers, much more contextualized answers. They might say things like respect, and so a little more abstract ideas. So to try to help elicit more advanced learning from the, the younger campers, <coughs> I might prompt them. So that zone of proximal development. If I want you to get here, I give you a little step, a scaffold, to help you get in your learning from this point to that point. So we're, again, we're going to have an example of that. So the handout there you have is, is primarily the adolescent development. <coughs> Um, Cairo in particular is a really challenging, challenging age group. Just is. You know that if you've worked it. Uh, and uh, as a parent of a 12, soon to be 13 year old, I'm living it day in and day out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's the freakiest thing to go to a middle school, particularly like a 6th to 8th grade school. And you can have 6th grade boys who have facial hair and 6th grade girls who are somewhat voluptuous. And eighth grade boys who look like they're in elementary school, and eighth grade girls who look like they're in elementary school. And they're all in this place together. And it's such a hodgepodge of people. And then we say, hey, it's a great idea. Let's bring them up the mountain and put them in a camp together and see what happens. <laughs> uh, the change, those physical changes that go on there are, are related to primarily to hormones, right? Um, and uh, so there's, it's raging hormone bill. You know that, I know that. So. Um, when we put them in camp, in, in groups together, we've got to allow for the reality that part of what they're learning is how to interact with one another. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I like to say when we bring family groups together is it's not about getting the lesson started. The truth is, the lesson has started. It starts the moment they walk in the room. And they're figuring out how to interact with one another. Uh, so. Um, if that helps be patient a little, helps you be patient a little bit when they're acting crazy, they're learning. They're acting crazy. They're trying on things, uh, trying on identities. Particularly that age group is great, is uh, is very self-centered, um, and not necessarily in a selfish way, but in a very. Um, uh, we talk about what we call primary narcissism. Okay, and if you remember the story of Narcissus, Narcissus is looking in the water and sees his reflection and falls in love with himself. Um, mm -hmm. But where that comes from, honestly, is a very fragile place. Um, so middle schoolers are very fragile. They're very insecure. And so the grandiosity or the attitude is all a part, a part of just kind of self-discovery, trying to figure it out. So um, our lack of patience with that will, I guarantee you, do one thing, frustrate us. 
And That's about the only thing hide. we'll do. Pardon? They hide with that confidence. Yeah, they do hide with that confidence. They or with or they hide, the yeah, they hide with the, the attitudes. They hide with doing bizarre things. Um, it's They're trying to figure out who they are. And, and at that age group in particular, there's a lot of a lot of craziness that can emerge. So we want to make sure that they're that their understanding of um, really the best thing we can do for them is to love them, honestly, and to be as patient with them as we can be, and uh, acknowledge them. Uh, but the sense of identity is crazy. There's this awkward nature. Um, you know, we, we, we talked about, uh, we were talking earlier about my, my son. I'm not going to say his name because now I'm on recording. <laughs> so, but anyway, so his, um, his, um, his body is, is doing amazing things and that you know, <laughs> three months later we'll be like, oh, we just bought you those jeans and now they're too short and he's gawky and he's running into things and it's just, <laughs> oh, just, oh, yeah, it's just the way it is. And so, yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's normative for that age group, but it also is very uncomfortable for him. Um, but he wants to be comfortable, but he's not comfortable. So if we can keep that in perspective that these young people want to be comfortable, but they're just not. That may help us be patient with them. I don't know. As they get a little bit older, uh, puberty begins to uh, complete its cycle, uh, which is both good and bad. Um, uh, because now sometimes, um, depending on what their cultural experience has been, their, their um, you know, they may have a, and by culture I'm not talking about ethnicity here, I'm just talking about the environment in which they, were, they grew up that informed their lives. Uh, some of them, by CYF1, CYF2, will have been maybe sexually active for a while. Uh, so there will be some real sophistication there. Uh, while for other young people there, will, well, there won't be. And they all come to camp together. We don't have a screening question about <laughs> any of those sorts of things. Um, they. Um, but the good thing about the getting a little bit older, once we get past like 14 or uh, an older, there's, there's, a, there's this capacity for being able to set goals and move forward. Uh, so now when we can, I think you were talking about this earlier, you know, you, literally in the parking lot, Ian was saying, I tried the CYF and, and to, to ask a question, they didn't want to talk about anything. And that's typical, unfortunately. When you have a CYF group that's really talkative and mature, celebrate. Uh, they're, they're on the curve way up above the rest of the kids. Uh, but you, you ask that question in CYF and then you're just like, ah, oh, we're running out of time. We can't get past this conversation. It, therein lies the, the, the joy. It's why we always have more volunteers for CYF camps, particularly CYF2, than many others. But later in life, there's that sense of identity. Later in adolescence, that sense of identity. So now my faith is not just facts like they were when I was a child. My faith is now my identity. We have a crisis in that when kids graduate from high school, they generally walk away from the church in large droves. And so if we can help them form a faith identity that's theirs, all the better. So let's, let's, let's take a look at a couple of things. For, so each family session you're given, um, you're given a certain amount of time. And so only a certain amount of time can be given to a quote unquote lesson or discussion, right? Then you've got this other time to fill. Um, honestly, the other time to fill is not that hard. You get a, get some good ideas off the internet, steal some steal some activity books, bring some games. There's things you can do to fill time. That's not so much the issue, uh, particularly if you've planned ahead of time. It's really more about that lesson or discussion time. How do I make it relevant? How do I get the most out of it as I can? Um, that's where the challenge is. So we talked about age. We talked about how age will guide. Um, uh, attention span. Um, so that's going to be a key element. So what I did was I took uh, took, a, took two lessons. One one you have, the other one I have. Um, but I want to look at um, from last year when we were looking at um, um, you know, the, the the deeper roots, higher reach, which I thought honestly was a really great curriculum, but. It was, uh, but I could see where, because I was talking to a counselor who was a mini, who worked with mini campers, and was like, you know, some of this was really complex. Like, okay, yeah, so we figured it out. But in my mind, I'm thinking, 
what do you mean deeper roots, higher reach? Every time I was I'd have a lesson, I'd be having kids acting like trees, doing all sorts of things, right? To get them engaged. Um, but easier said than done in the moment, right? Especially if you have been recruited last minute or something like that, which is a reality. So one of the examples of the lessons from last year was depth. We looked at depth. And so the story was uh, told from Mark where the sower comes and, he, and the sower spreads the seeds on the soil, right? And it gets the different soils and, uh, and uh, finally comes across the good soil and it grows and that sort of thing. You've heard that, you've heard that parable many times. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick sort of rundown of different ways to, to go about that. So you've got a story like that. What do you do with a story like that? So, with the younger children, we know that they're going to be, I can't just read the scripture to them, because it's 20 verses long, and have them really get excited. I may not even want to have them read it just yet, because then it becomes about whether or not they have good reading skills and all those sorts of things. So, I want to be careful with that. But I want to, but I want to tell the story. So, Maybe what I do is I start looking at elements. Remember, I've read it, and I'm going to begin to adapt it after I've identified the theme. So I'm going to have, uh, if I did that story, I might have as many as eight or nine volunteers help me act out that story. I'd have one of the children be the farmer. I'd have one of the children be a certain kind of soil, another kind of soil. And I, one kid gets to be Satan. That's a really exciting one because he gets to go out and pull him and pull him down. So we enact the story of this different sort of soil. So I have somebody... Uh, I could have four for the seeds, I could have four for each soil result, one for the farmer, on and on it goes. Maybe I don't have a kid be Satan, because that might be, I don't want to stigmatize them for the rest of their life. But, uh, but I certainly want to, it's like, oh yeah, I remember you, you were Satan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, maybe I don't do that. But, uh, but you know, I'm, but I'm in terms of engaging as I tell the story and have them act it out. Right? So, I could do that literally up through Cairo. Because even some of the Cairo kids would really get into that. Others might not. Uh, probably not going to do that with the high schoolers. But, you know, I know my son would have, but that's because yeah. he's special. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, but, but one of the lessons, one of the lessons in, uh, one, one of the questions in the curriculum asked, asked this question. Said, so can this is again, this is from a different lesson than you have, because we're going to practice with your, yours in the next. It says, can the seed itself actually change the nature of the soil? Can the seed itself actually change the nature of the soil? And the writer of the curriculum infers that we can, okay, that it can, because it's about the gospel. It's about the good news of Christ being, you know, coming into, you know, as we spread the good news of Christ, we can actually change the soil, which is a really profound sort of thing. It's not going to be a lesson necessarily that I'm going to tackle with my younger ones, because that's a big sort of idea, unless I make it very concrete. So, for example, I might ask them, because that's a higher order question. It's a kind of a philosophical, abstract question. The CYF students could really grapple with that. Even Cairo might be able to, but younger than that, it's going to be difficult. So for the younger children, I might ask a question, something like, who loves you? Who in your life loves you? And they begin to talk to me about who loves you. My mom, my dad, my aunt, my uncle, my grandmother, whoever. People who love them, right? So I begin to talk about love. And I say, okay, so how do you know that they love you? What do they do that they show you to love? I'm making it very concrete, making it very behavioral, in terms they can understand. And I say something along the lines, then we, could, we can say the seed that's being spread is love. And when it lands on us, we can grow and be followers of Jesus and love others. Very concrete lesson. I could ask them, then who do you know in your life that needs some love? Who needs some good loving? And they can talk about who do they know that needs love. And now I'm going to scaffold, because they're going to say my mom, my dad. My, they're going to give you many of the same answers. So I mean, is there somebody at school who feels left out? Is there somebody at church who feels left out? Somebody in your neighborhood who feels left out? I'm scaffolding. So I'm giving them some information to have them then take the lesson and go, oh, yeah, I could take, be good friends with so-and-so and develop a relationship with that child. Um, 
And then I begin to ask about how can we show them God's love? That comes from can the seed itself actually change the nature of the soil? Which is a higher order question. But I break it down into love. So that takes time. That takes me reading it and figuring out what I feel like the theme is, adapting it. I can't do that the night before. As much as I might like to think I can. I can't do that the night before. Um, I actually did this two nights before. So, uh, <laughs> but, but it takes some time. And I was also at home. I wasn't at camp trying to figure out how am I going to get this kid to brush his teeth because he hasn't brushed his teeth for two days. Yeah. Uh, something like that. Not that that would ever happen. Um, no. um, so we go through one of the other stories talks about um, uh, needing to have a firm foundation. The other story from the, the, the depth day last year was about building our houses on firm soil. And um, so there's an abstract idea. Again, the curriculum writers, this is usually a pastor who's sitting in his or her uh, study waxing poetic about these important theological concepts. That's what they're doing. They've been asked to write a curriculum, right, that could be used for everybody. So this person writes, a deep foundation of faith ensures durability in the midst of storms or troubles. I'll say that again. A deep foundation of faith ensures durability in the midst of storms or, or troubles. You and I hear that and we think, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, I have deep faith, it makes me stronger. Read that to your mini campers or your junior campers. And, uh, okay, don't know what that means. I was picking my notes, what'd you say? Uh, <laughs> so that's gonna be what's happening there. So, but when we look at a concept like that, you know, where we, where we made the other one concrete for our CYFers, we could literally ask them about what storms or troubles that they have that challenge their faith. And they'll come up with that, right? They can take the abstract idea and apply it. But we may not be able to do that very likely at all. Uh, high row campers might need a little bit of help. Uh, they might need an example. Uh, but as we go down, uh, you know, when we look at our junior and mini campers, they would need a whole lot of help there. So, uh, go ahead. Say, yeah, please do. One thing that comes to my mind when I think of the uh, junior camp or Minis is the Veggie Tales. I think of Veggie mm -hmm. Tales. You know those little yeah. videos mm -hmm. that take because that, that made me think of the song about building your house on sand yeah. and rock. And that's what it is. Veggie Tales is this wonderful little song, mm -hmm. and that'd be the time. To sing. Yeah. So you Perfect can teach them through that. Yeah. And and you know even yeah. Veggie Tales. I mean that, yeah. they're really good yeah. at yeah. adapting. Right. And even Veggie Tales, concepts. what they will do is they'll they'll bring it to the end of the usually the end of the store. They they go to the computer. Gordy, what? what's the word today and now then they kind of like uh, for the children they're like get ready here's the lesson here's the moral of the story uh -huh. and here's the moral yeah. of the story which uh, doesn't make really great theater but it's a great teaching tool <laughs> yeah no that's what I'm saying yeah, you know, people right. who are doing that age group needs that's a tool that's that, right that would exactly. be important or the high school kids probably wouldn't enjoy it right that's true they want switch foot you know right. <laughs> lyrics yeah, I love it just switch foot mm -hmm. did an album but they just covered Reggie Tail songs did they really? That would be oh. Dibs, Money Maker. Uh, right so junior <laughs> camp. So let me just kind of give you an outline of a couple of different sessions. So if you're doing junior camp, okay, I would suggest that the, you're going to begin the session, beginning a family session with some sort of game, some sort of song, something that's that's interactive, mm -hmm. not just interactive but active, uh, not crazy active. You know, this isn't the time to play tag, but interactive experiential, moving around, that sort of thing. Uh, back in my day, it was Father Abraham. The yeah, great thing was because you, but, but you could do that. Head, head, shoulders, yeah, head, yeah, all that sort of, yeah, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, all those sort of things. Um, so, <coughs> going back, we could have them, we could elicit volunteers as we Sorry. read the scripture, they act it out about, you know, the, 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 um, the seed. We talk about love that we talked about. We pray, then we've got another game. We've got more songs. That's it. That's all I'm going to be able to do with that age group. Uh, so I'm going to have to have a bag of tricks that I bring with me. Uh, active sorts of interactive things. It can't be about the lesson full. Because again, if these are my, these are my 10 year olds, in terms of being able to do that scripture and the conversation, 30 minutes max. Max for them. Um, to be safe. Again, my CYFers now, it's all about, I can have, um, you know, when we talk about that, um, uh, 
um, yeah, there's a whole lot more we can do. One of the best things to do with particularly the CYFers uh, is to think about um, provocative questions mm -hmm. related to the, the theme, related to the lesson. So we should do some activities. We should maybe do some music. Uh, one of the things that we underutilize, I think, sometimes in our family group times is our music person. Mm -hmm. Maybe that person could rotate around and work with the different family group sessions and provide a little music. If you're not a gifted musician and you're a counselor but you'd like to have a little music time in your family, there's no reason that we can't work that out. It's something we have to let our camp directors know we want. And we figure that out. Uh, but uh, because that's going to help be useful too. Uh, so let's take a look. You guys have in front of you, I picked a shorter one for you. Day three has to do with length, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to literally arbitrarily, from Ian over this side to Nancy, why don't you guys work together and think about how you might work with this particular lesson, um, with this particular passage, with the junior campers. What kinds of things you might do with junior campers. So, and then from Emily around to Justin, um, why don't you guys think about CYF1, what you might do with this particular uh, lesson with CYF1. Let's take a, just take a few minutes brainstorm on just some ideas. We'll take maybe, I don't know, five, ten minutes max. And then we'll come back together and, uh, and uh, see what kind of ideas you came up with. Sound good? We won't listen. Um, <laughs> so first off, it was really fun to listen to the two groups um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it was uh, it was interesting that the CYF conversation got much deeper, much faster than the junior camp conversation. Not because of the personalities of the people in the group, but because of the personalities of your campers mm -hmm. and because of the capabilities of your campers. And that, in and of itself, Boom is what we're talking about. Taking the, my campers' um, cognitive, emotional, you know, physical development into 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 consideration when I begin to plan my lessons. So, well done. It was also though interesting to hear, uh, and this this is you know, tr traditional. Well, this traditionally happens, but it's, it's something I think we all should celebrate. How both groups saw the same texts. They saw the same, or they saw the same uh, lesson and they brought different things out of it. Uh, and you'll, I think you'll hear that in, in the conversations from when we share about each, each person, each group's lesson. Uh, but really, I mean, that's what we celebrate. That's, that's, that's the disciples' tradition, isn't it not? I mean, you know, um, the, the priesthood of the believer, the, the, uh, the fact that we all come to the, the lessons and the scriptures together, and uh, we find a way to, uh, um, to hear what it is that God would have us hear. From, from, from a given text, so that's awesome. I love that. So I'm going to pick on the uh, junior campers first. So here we're talking roughly approximately 9 to 11 year olds. Um, and uh, uh, so you guys give us a sense of what you did. And I'll do my best to jot it down as you go. So what's the first thing you're going to do with these young people in this hour we, you spend with them? We kind of uh, looked, we read it and decided what words popped out to us. Okay, what were some of the words and, that popped out? And nature popped out. We talked about trust. We kind of decided what a theme would be with that. Okay, so nature, trust, anything else? Uh, gifts Okay. was like self-awareness oh. and giving. And the last thing that we kind of evolved toward, the other thing that we talked about was self-awareness. Okay. Those were kind of the, oh, I already said that. Right. Those are the themes. All right. So did you guys Hold come up with any way. similar sorts of themes related when you were going through it? Because mm -hmm. yeah. you guys were talking a lot about justice. Yeah. Yeah. So what, so justice related to giving or justice related to, what, what came up for you guys? Um, I guess gifts as a, as a, means by which we can achieve justice. Mm -hmm. so, so we are given gifts in ourselves. order to promote justice? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We kind of decided we would take the, because the gifts part kind of comes second in the way this is 
laid out. So we decided we'd kind of do that first. And then as we go through the, the first part of it, how we can use our gifts to spread out and become a shelter for So you decided just because the curriculum is written a particular way doesn't mean that we have to follow it that way. Exactly. Right. And that's true. Yeah. <laughs> because there is something, there are other variables in relationship to everything that happens when you sit down with this group of kids. One is, I've heard a lot of people, because this was day three, and several people talked about the importance of day three and where day three plays in the role of the... One, something else we know about day three is that they're pooped. <laughs> they're tired. Um, we're tired. They're tired. So, um, so that's a variable that we have to take into consideration when we're considering these, you know, when we're planning all this sort of stuff. So gifts related to justice, anything else, any other sort of thematic element that popped out for you guys? That's fine. If it's not, that's good. Okay, so these are the themes. So then what are you going to do with them? Activity-wise, when they walk in, they're going to do what? First thing we thought of trust uh, kind of icebreakers. Okay. And we immediately thought of one that was uh, probably not good for this age group, which was the trust fall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not, probably not good for nine. So, so um, Mike uh, thought of the bandana, close your eyes, put a bandana over here, and the trust walk. Oh, that's okay. Better than the trust fall. In right. this age group. <laughs> so, great differentiation based on, um, you know, based on developmental capability. Uh -huh. Might you do the trust fall somewhere else? Yeah, sure. CYF2. Yeah, sure. yeah, maybe so. Yeah. But uh, good. So, so then after that, if you've done the trust walk, and I love the trust walk. It's so cool. Yeah. Uh, particularly if kids really get into it. Um, and they can trust one. <laughs> and then that was the part of the nature thing. We could do it outside. Have them take, pair up, and go outside. Okay. So they're, go they're going outside at, during the trust walk? Uh -huh. Okay. And then once you're done with the trust walk, what are you doing? You're outside still? At that point, or what are you doing? What are we doing? Can be outside, outside still, <laughs> but then the next one uh, on self-awareness, doing a move it activity where there's one person in the middle calls out, you know, if you have blonde hair, move it. And so it kind of brings all of these things that the kids, kids feel awkward about, but then they, then they see, yeah, that everybody's standing in a circle yeah. or sitting in a circle. Um, everybody is then made aware of, oh, I'm like this person in this way. Yeah. So differences. And I'm coming, differences. Right, but I'm coming in touch with myself, mm -hmm. right, which is great. It's still, and, and that's, that in and of itself is kind of a scaffolding opportunity because I become, you're helping me become aware. I'm not standing there self-aware, but you're helping me become aware by virtue of this. Like, oh yeah, I have blue eyes. I'm supposed yeah. to move. And, now, and because I'm relatively still self-centered at this point, then all of a sudden I begin to relate to other people and the connections that they have. Sure. Yeah. And then, boom, what else? That's good. We get to our, is it the, is it the, oh no, you had a craft, right? Yeah, so then we, we wanted to um, bring in the gifts and uh, to, to kind of start thinking about what I'm good at and, okay. and uh, self-awareness of gifts. So we thought at this age group it would be a craft. Okay. That they would make something. All righty. Did you have any so idea why yet? Or? Uh, no. Because you can, no. you can always get that stuff. No. But I mean, you know, we're up at Lock 11, you know, so we got yeah. paint and nature rocks. Stuff. And yeah, there's nature stuff. Yeah. And there's, Pine cones. And there's wonderful. We're going to make gifts. <laughs> you know, you can. Nart. We call it nart. Nature art. Nature, nature art. That's yeah. good. But craft related so just, to, yeah. to gifts. Uh-huh. Something, a craft that we're going to give to somebody. So, oh, okay. Giving it. Oh, yes, okay. yeah, give it, give whatever uh, the craft is. Whatever you like make. Paint a beautiful rock and then give it else. to Exactly. Or give it to Lock 11, actually. There you go. So then, you've been doing a lot of teaching already along the way, but then you have anything else? Then Do there's it. 10 minutes of discussion, bringing back the themes from the activities. Reading the scriptures, because we hadn't read the scripture yet. Right. So this is when we do the, we all sit down. And read the scripture and and relate it to all those things. We yeah, did, yeah. All those concepts. Yeah. You could throw in music if you needed to at some point. You know, obviously, if you had people who had musical acuity um, or had you know the resource to do that. But yeah. So we're thinking 15, 15, 20, 10. Yeah. Sweet. And that's why you also have things like balls and other sorts of things in your quote unquote toolkit, bucket, wherever, uh, arsenal, uh, so that you have a sense of this is what I can do if this runs short, right? So we want to always have some sort of backup plan if something doesn't work or something runs short. Um, all right, so CYF, 
wonders. That's what you guys do. Yeah. Um, so, so walk in. So these are the themes. These are the yeah. things that, that came to you out yeah. of reading the script, reading the lesson. Sure. And so you're thinking, this is now when they come in, what are we going to do? Uh, well, with this age group, and it being the third day, um, we kind of figure that our conversation will be getting better. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. really, yeah. day three and day four, like you said, are the two best days for to have the deepest conversation. So uh, if the group is, is one that can handle it, we want to just go straight into the conversation piece. Okay. Um, if it's not a group that can handle it, then that's part of knowing your family group and you adjust accordingly and, and you do a, a moving around game, some kind of kinesthetic learning, whatever. Um, do you have any in mind or? Uh, well, we're talking about uh, gifts and empowerment and justice and all that sort of stuff. So, um, kind of along the same lines, like I'm spitballing this on the top of my head now, okay. along the same lines of a movie activity, but okay. some kind of like, you know, if you are really good at theater or sports, like which would you rather do sort of thing. Sure. I don't know. Um, so okay. a role play. Yeah. Yeah, or more something. along those lines. Yeah, but some, something there in case you need it. And again, yeah. you have to know the personality of your group, yeah. you which you obviously you don't know. Yeah. Until you get up there. Sure. So we're um, going with the yeah. fact that our group is one that is okay. having good conversation. All right. That is our base assumption. <laughs> okay. So your base, base assumption here with these 14, this. roughly 14 to 16 year olds, you're going to begin with conversation. Are you doing that for the whole hour or are you doing anything else? Uh, no, probably uh, we want to let it go as long as they're into it. Mm -hmm. So kind of prep or preparing for 25 to 30 mm -hmm. um, if they're able to go there. Mm -hmm. um, a, a loosely formatted in the sense that uh, the kids will tell us what it is that they want to talk about. Okay. They'll let us know what it is that they need out of this. So we are just there to help facilitate and give order to it. So the inherent assumption there is that when we get, get a little bit older, mm -hmm. and this makes sense, that the voice of our campers becomes more prominent or important. Uh -huh. They kind of want to be able and influential. to influential. Pardon? They kind of want to be able to lead yeah. the conversation. Sure. They're going to they be able feel to... feel limited if we kind of tell them. Particularly if a young person comes from a, a history of being in camps. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, they, they have a, a sense of, oh, this is what this time is about. And now I get to deal with whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever's on my that's on my heart or my mm -hmm. on my mind, and then some sort of, I can bring my agenda to the group because this, I know I can take care of it. Here. Yeah, and we also have to be conscious too that there's probably people that it's their first time ever at camp, and it's very uncomfortable to yeah. be sharing things right. and like, wait, what? You guys want to listen to what I have to say? Like that's weird. Sure. Um, so. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Knowing mm -hmm. that that's true, mm -hmm. and and I definitely believe that that's true. Um, how do you help that? Or how do you help that camp? We talked about we yeah. talked about starting with or, or being prepared to lead the conversation in this way, which would be starting with um, the fourth chapter of Ephesians, which is the second half, mm -hmm. um, and and having a gifts conversation. Uh, when have you been successful in, in life? Um, you know, wh what do you think you're really good at? What do you do really well? Um, and then, um, based on how that kind of goes, possibly flowing into going back to Mark and the first half of the piece and then guiding the conversation into how could those how could those specific gifts or how have you used those specific gifts to really extend the kingdom and um, and, and be welcoming of people and, and create justice um, and, and how could you yeah yeah so. but I love how you're starting with a, a strengths orientation from the get-go right you know, begin mm -hmm. by talking about what it is about myself that I can, can embrace and I can celebrate mm -hmm. Because again, even though I'm CYF1, I'm still trying to figure out who I am. And I still run into the same issue as every other young person when I look in the mirror and I've got a pimple in my forehead, all I see is the pimple. I don't see the rest of my face, <laughs> I see the pimple. So there is some sorts of, there is a sense of being able to celebrate who I am and look at my strengths first, which is really great. That's great. To add one little thing to that too, we even talked a little bit about uh, what it might look like after. Uh, after talking about the gifts and the strengths and stuff, being prepared to lead them back into the other piece of how we can extend that, but maybe even inviting them to to explore what the connection might be before you know w between these two pieces, uh, and then 
but providing additional guidance if necessary. Yeah, so getting sure. Guidance. So again, scaffolding based on how, what they're able to bring in, sure. And, and even in this age span, there's a lot that can happen here. Um, you know, and I heard I heard Emily saying something along the lines of how um, if, you're, if you're on the ninth, if you're on, if you're if you're coming out of eighth yeah. grade and you're moving into the high school, it's new for you. It's um, and you're there with the people who maybe have been there for a couple of years and the have first, had some. Yeah. They've been acculturated to what CYF is, mm -hmm. the CYF camps are like, and how they're different from Tyrell. Yeah, because the, the first year of high school is huge. That's. It's a completely different transition from coming from junior high. It's a whole different culture. Yeah. So half the camp has already experienced it, and half the camp is nervous and has no idea what to expect going into high school. So it's yeah. two very, very well, different Well, not only their, their home high school, but their high school camp experience. Yes. Yeah. There's different the expectations. Day? What's the crying day? Friday? Uh, this, is how, this is Wednesday. 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 Doesn't anybody cry in family group on yeah. Friday? Yeah. When, yeah. Thursday, Thursday, Friday. Thursday, Friday. Thursday, yeah. Friday. Yeah. Wednesday. You really bear your soul, yeah. so you're leading way up to it right now. Yeah, you're kind of tilling the ground. You know, <laughs> right. You're making sure the ground is <laughs> the, that things are. You know, not, not that our ultimate goal is to make kids cry, because uh, we could do that much now more easily than doing all these things. You're sharing your feelings. Yeah, right, right. So, but so the, the yeah, relationships have been built to the point that I'm able to, that I feel safe sharing myself. And, right. You know, my, you know, you would be safer, I would guess, even with this age group, to have something in your pocket, whether or not it's something like a, you know, a ball or a movement activity or something. Uh, there's some, um, there's some. Um, we do. We got more. Oh, good. You have. <laughs> oh, okay. Huh? Yeah. What else did you have? We had an activity. Oh, okay. Somebody well, else want. I've been talking too much. No, it's okay. What was your activity? We did. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> it, it was. It was more, I guess, a, a refocused conversation, but it was kind of the action items piece. Oh, so oh okay, okay. It's uh, it's the, you know, we'll we were talking about gifts and justice and using gifts and all that. So, what are real tangible ways? Right here at camp, that we act this out. Oh yes. Okay. So make a list. Um, yeah. How yeah, do we, we practice? We talked about make a list. Uh, Is it reaching out to or thinking about people who maybe you see that are left out, you know, around like at music time or at free time, mm -hmm. and how you can reach out and pull them in, and have them feel the kingdom of God, and have kind of be a make camp a home, kind of like the mustard seed bush became a home for the yeah, kids. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. And so we talked about developmentally, this is the age group where we're able to set goals a little more effectively. Yeah. You're challenging them to do that. You're looking at action items, looking at how I can make a difference. Um, huge, very huge. Again, again, whether it's some, there's, a, there's something called a crossing the line activity. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's basically I'm, I'm with a group of people, we're all on this side, and I say something along the lines of cross the line if you have ever, and you do the whole thing in silence. And so, and it's all a challenge by choice. If I choose to disclose that, so I, it can be things like challenge you know, cross the line. If you've ever, you know, traveled to Europe, uh, it could be something as benign as that starting out. Um, although I've never been to Europe, so why did I bring that? Anyway, because uh, so, uh, you were or, always left behind. Right? <laughs> uh, that's sort of hurt, deep hurt. Um, uh, but it could be something as as uh, personally challenging as to cross the line, particularly for getting to justice. Cross the line if you've ever told a racist joke or laughed at a racist joke, uh, those sorts of things. So then I have to challenge myself. Do I disclose to these people? Do I not? And then we talk about it at the end. So, you know, particularly when you get to the older groups, you can do that sort of thing, and it's really yeah. powerful. Uh, you know, Cairo would be disaster. You know, <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah, it's just... <laughs> so, um, but but That's notice and, and and you guys, this is what you see on the board is part of what the um, challenges for the directors is. When we start into CYF land, people begin to think, oh, I don't have to be as activity based. There's more just interaction with the young people, and and there's more capacity that they have to to deal with ideas, and we can converse and all those sorts of things. And so the list gets. What I have to do with them, <laughs> there's more white space here, right? I don't have to be as busy. I'm, I'm spending as much time, but I don't have as much activity stuff. This, the, the younger age groups just require a little more pre-planning. They just do. Uh, and um, so, but the counselors who do a really great job with these campers, 
are the ones that you should be thinking when you're working with these campers, mm -hmm. and they're they're really invested mm -hmm. because these people have really helped create a culture, a camp culture, mm -hmm. that you're able to celebrate when you're hanging out with these kids. <laughs> They've done a lot of the labor for you. And and being young and fresh out of uh, you know high school camp, I've also been in groups where it's a disaster because the counselors came in thinking it's going to be easy and yeah. they weren't yeah. you know really prepared and mm -hmm. this is this would be good i hope everybody does this yeah. um but but yeah i think it's also important to when you're staffing make sure that you know you're not going to pick people that are like oh this is going to be a piece of cake i'm just going to go with older kids and they'll do everything themselves yeah. yeah sometimes you do need a good uh, conversation starter and, sure sure yeah and i would also suggest in your schedule that the directors spend time with their counselors to debrief on, okay, what's your plan today? What's working? What's because, <laughs> like, or the night before, you know, um, because if they haven't thought it through or if they have a, a lousy plan, like if they want to do this with junior camp, yeah. that, you know, <laughs> right. put that into your director's schedule that you're going to help them, you know, yeah. adjust before it falls apart. Yeah, and, and the <laughs> great, gratefully, we're going, we're not going out into the wilderness where there aren't any resources. We're going to an established campsite where there's stuff, mm -hmm. there's supplies, there's board games, there's toys, there's things that we can you know, call on there. It's not like we have to send people to, to some sort of fill time school. Uh, there's things mm -hmm. to do that with. We just want to be aware of them and make sure that we're, yes. we're ready for them. Um, you know, I, I share, so I, I don't foresee myself in any way, shape, or form as an expert on any of this stuff. I really just, uh, I'm a fellow struggler, obviously, and so on. I've, and I've been, oh, I've been in this situation where um, I felt like I wanted to do one thing and it didn't work. Um, as a keynoter, I've tried things that have gone like a lead balloon. It just didn't go over at all. So, um, you know, we're all in it together. Uh, and that's one of the great things that also about the meetings is that we can, I hope that as a counseling staff, uh, that we can look at one another and say, dude, I'm struggling, help me. Um, and the other thing about so, the leader is to not blame the kids. Make yeah. sure we do. It's not the kids' fault. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. how can we be better to help them? Yeah. It, well, and every, camp, really every camp has its own personality. Every kid has their own personality. Every family group has its own personality. And, um, um, you know, and, and there are always variables, again, that the, 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 has the head kid had enough to eat? Have they... Um, have they gotten enough rest? Which the answer to that will always be no. I can't. Uh, <laughs> just like you, you will not have had enough rest, and perhaps not enough to eat. But um, but um, there will there is also though variable variables like um, um, like the time when we were at Upper Ross, Lower Ross, and other Ross. Ross. You know, how many kids are there, <laughs> and do we have enough camp? You know, now all of a sudden, I, my family group has more in it than I expected, and uh, so. Um, there, there's, there are things that we can never predict for. This is just encouragement for us to be as ready as we can be and know that you know, a lot of things can happen. So, Good job. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you. Oh gosh, awesome. thanks. Awesome. Good, good scout.